For PY, raise your hand. Uh, PO, I will take one uh, for comparative upfront. So do ask one. <laughs> and please ask your case. Don't try to give a throw with you. Starting up speech in three, two, one. I want to do two things in setup. The first, I want to explain how this trading specifically occurs in status quo because it's the most realistic thing that happens. And second, on setup, I'm going to explain what these companies specifically are and what their incentives are. The first the observation I would make is the fact that the way it's done in status quo is to initial public offerings, which is IPOs. And these are specific places in which companies go ahead and have lots of stuff. But they do three kinds of things in IPOs. The first thing they do is the fact that they actively reveal the public information of what are the shares that they need to trade with or what are the shares that are up for grabs where investors can specifically invest into. But secondly, what they do is stuff such as due diligence agreements or disclosure agreements where they actively go ahead and give lots of information about where they've invested in the past or what they're doing currently or what their future prospects specifically are. So there's a massive flow of information of what the specific incentives of these companies are or what they plan to do or what they've done in the past. But the third thing that they say is, the, is explaining the regulatory standards Standards that they have in, 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 in times at which there is lots of financial crisis, probably up. So, companies, the way in which they do this is to say that we are not going to have a 2008 economic crisis again because we are going to do stuff and we have regulation in place where probably uh, like regulation in place which can specifically keep the market in check. But, like, more importantly, we would not fall into like economic uh, crisis. The comparative on off is that you don't trade this publicly, which means that obviously off one has to find different ways of going ahead, going ahead and getting more investor confidence in the absence of public trading, publicly trading. So they have to rely on other comparatives, but more importantly, they have to give a mechanism of how accountability is going to occur on their side, because that's the metric that we're going to set as a student. Is there any clarification in the comparative? Okay, never mind. Second thing on setup, what are these companies? The first thing I would just note is the fact that these are companies with a billion market dollar value as context like states. This is super important yeah. because we think go ahead. Why would you require companies to file an IPO after they reach the billion dollar value? Repeat. Why when would you require companies to file for an IPO after they become like reach a billion dollar value? They, so they can do it at any point, like it's their choice. Like you can debate what their timing timing is. The first thing I would just note is the fact that the fact that we have a billion dollar market share specifically means that you have lots of capital in the market, but more importantly, your capacity to go and rock out other actors out of the, out of the market is substantially higher, augmented by the fact that you have massive amounts of capital. So the way in which this works is the fact that lots of corporates go ahead and throw smaller startups out of the market due to things like financial mismanagement, where they like, like have a huge amount of capital which they direct towards things like discounts so that they can throw startups out of the market via the virtual financial mismanagement. They can take this money away from, say, their employee, employee benefits, but more importantly, the internal regulatory mechanisms. So we just think that regulation is far worse than opposition, which we're going to explain in the second part of the speech. The second thing is, we think that there's also lesser accountability on part of these corporations by the fact that because these are billion dollar corporations, the amount of lobbying power that they have in states to go and actively deregulate themselves is also substantially higher because of the fact that these uh, states get lots of benefits out of corporates, probably such as, oh, these people are big, big employers. So probably states don't question corporates in the vast amount of instances. This matters because I think this is the thing that gives the most amount of information status quo. And we just don't think that there's enough trust in the developing world markets on their side of the house. The way I want to frame this argument is to say that you uniquely gain trust at the point at which you have IPOs or you have FPOs, which are all of public, public offerings, where the amount of information that you get about the market is substantially higher. The first thing I would just note is the fact that investor conference doesn't really happen on their side of the house because if they want to say that we can also have things like CSR policies or, or we can also do things like signaling, we just don't think that is the way in which investors invest insofar as they have other calculus, which well, I'm going to explain. But the second thing I would just note is the fact that we can also claim it on our side of the house. So this debate also has to happen on margins as to how we substantially increase the amount of investment that we have. Let's explain how IPOs are uniquely the way in which to build trust. The first thing I would note is the fact that in that investors are often discovered and the kind of information that they rely upon is often financial information or the unique internal stuff that these companies do as opposed to the other sort of stuff or the out outward image that these companies specifically have. have. This is augmented by the fact that a lot of these like uh, yeah. corporations are developing not now. 
a lot of corporations in the developing world probably are, are, are viewed as corrupt. So, if, so, so for you to build market trust, the, the foreign investor, the VC, or the venture capitalists who want to invest in your country specifically have incentives to get the information to make sure that these companies can uniquely survive market shocks. The second thing I would just note is the fact that when an IPO is conducted, obviously the amount of financial journalism that occurs is also substantially higher because probably if TCS or Wipro or Reliance actively engage in things like IPOs, we just think that the amount of coverage that is going to have seven and eighty times is just substantially higher because this is a big news in the financial market where this company has decided to go ahead and give lots of information. I just think that this is the unique way in which you build trust because investors now have a greater incentive to invest into the economy. Go ahead. So I can file for an IPO at any point of time, right? What your side should defend is that within a short period of time after I reach a billion dollar status, I need to file. The problem so is that once you, okay, like it's about the specific market value. We explained that this market value is so substantial that it become unaccountable. That is the reason why we explained that the IPO is important because once you reach that $1 billion mark is a point at which you are super accountable. You can't just say that, oh, once, and like it's, if it is slightly lesser than $1 billion, then we, then we won't have an IPO. The intent of the debate is for you to explain that once these companies be, become too big to fail, that is the point at which they, they should be going and, and engaging in IPOs. I just think then that this is super important because this is a unique way in which you get investor trust. This is important for two specific reasons. The first thing I would note is the fact that you can uniquely have more investment and liquidity within markets in the developing world. Because presumably, you have companies have, having $1 billion market share in most countries, and hence VCs do not have incentives to go ahead and invest into companies uh, in the developing world insofar as they are viewed as corrupt. But like more importantly, there's a geographical imbalance. So as long as companies are competing with each other, we just think that you need a greater amount of trust for you to go ahead and have more amounts of investment in the developing markets. This is super important because we just think in the absence of this, the amount of funding that you can get from foreign, <laughs> like from foreign, foreign companies or, or VCs is just substantially lesser. The second independent benefit that we had is the benefit of accountability. I want to note that when these investors go and get on board, the way in which they can frame company policies is a way in which they can actively regulate the companies. So the first thing I would just note is the fact that the kind of influence that investors have is proportional to the share that you own. So presumably, if these investors have incentives to uh, uh, if these investors are convinced by the regulatory mechanisms, they can invest more and more, which means that the amount of shares that they have also substantially increases, which consequently means that they can have a greater voting power. But secondly, probably uh, a lot of the, a lot of these uh, policies are like are formed in blocks where probably uh, investors lobby with each other to frame company policies. This matters because we think in the absence of this, the, uh, in the absence of this, one the accountability that these billion dollar companies have towards their own employees also substantially reduces, augmented by the fact that these people don't really have any strong regulatory mechanism in check. But more importantly the kind of bad practice that they engage in towards startups, which is by actively having the amounts of money to go and lock these startups out of the market can only be checked at the point at which you have specific regulatory mechanisms in place. The final benefit that we have is just an argument on accountability, which I would note is the most important thing in this round because investment become much more risk averse on outside the house because if this is a cascading effect where all companies are doing this, obviously one this reduces corporate distrust in the vast amount of developing nations, which means that companies and individuals have incentives to trust the market much more, which they of itself with an independent impact in the round because what that does is that one it reduces the amount of market uncertainty that people have but then more importantly in the absence of in the absence of this we think people opt into much more riskier investments through things like the oversources on oversource of information on the internet which can often be unregulated because of the fact that they're not strong reg regulatory mechanisms of financial information in check that is the reason why we think the debate because we have much more information but more importantly this is very good information Right. I'll start my speech in 30 seconds. Just give me time to start on our um, Is there a timekeeper in the house? We'll take a stop one. Yeah. All right. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Pan, today what site proposition gives to us is a very wash case, and I'll tell you as to why on what metrics this case does not stand at all. They talk about as to how investor trust is something that is built only by the companies publicly traded. 
we need to realize that startups who are not publicly traded also have to disclose information also as you go to the, uh, go through due diligence also as you go through all these procedures to invite investors in the first place we need to realize that vc funds do invest into all these startups also in the first place and they do check whether these companies are going to follow regulatory frameworks or not and by the very nature of that we think that the entire uh, entire point of invest investor trust uh, like uh, surpassing all each uh, all heights uh, uh, goes for wash just because every existing investor has access to all those information in the first place. Now, then what kind of investors they are talking about, right? They are talking about investors who are going to come to the uh, who are going to come to the table, like retail investors or uh, in layman's language, uh, people who are uh, traders and who want to uh, actually invest in these companies, right? We tell you as to why in that case also it is not good. All right. So let me first catch right as to how this motion is going to look like, right? Let us understand as to how does this valuation game happens. To be charitable to side proposition, we say that these companies were able to value themselves in the most effective manners and 1 billion is the right valuation on which they stand, right? Now, what is the problem after they go public, right? What we will tell you is that the reason why uh, the companies do not go public or why it is a strategic decision is because companies have this $1 billion uh, valuation on different mechanisms, right? Either it can be equity based, either it can be debt based, it can be revenue based, it can be sale based, uh, uh, sale based all right? So the reason why companies have a corporate decision or a strategic decision to enter into a uh, into an IPO is because they do not want to go on and increase their equity capital, that is like uh, the investors fund in the first place at the point at which i say that every one billion dollar company has to go out and increase their equity capital or whatever has, has to pop their structure all together so that they comply with the governmental norms we say that that particular company in itself is going to lose valuation is going to lose revenue just because now uh, the kind of structure on which this company wants to work they cannot work on that structure and that takes away the autonomy of the company why is autonomy of the company very important because we need to realize that this company was able to reach one billion dollars only because they were able to uh, generate that kind of revenue and that kind of value in the post space. This value remains intrinsic value. All right. We do make a note uh, of the point that this is the intrinsic value of the fund, right? At a point at which this intrinsic value gets uh, publicly traded to the market against the wishes of the companies or just because they have to comply to any uh, regulatory framework, they are not able to decide as to how the structure is going to look like. And at that particular point of time, we think uh, that the company is more about to fall than to start, right? Now, second thing, the idea of trickling down of wealth, right? Which is a major uh, question which can uh, arise in the uh, uh, government's case, even uh, even from the closing government, right? Why do we take over them, uh, them as well? We need to realize as to how this public trading game works, right? In public trading, the companies get overvalued. I'll explain it in the most layman term, right? That, that thing tomorrow, like the value of the company is going to be based on uh, laws of demand and supply. The main minute the demand increases to a, to a larger extent, the company is going to be overvalued to uh, another level, right? What is the problem in that, right? So if a retail investor owns share worth one, uh, uh, like 1,000 rupees and it, uh, the company has like enormous amount of demand flowing in, at that point of time, that share will go on to rise like at 10,000 rupees or 15,000 rupees. But we need to realize that the intrinsic value of the company remains 1,000 itself. It is only the laws of uh, like the forces of demand and supply which has increased the value so much. And that is why even if we think that we have got uh, we have gotten some wealth out of that company, it is not real wealth. It is basically something which is not existed in the first place, right? Now moving forward as to uh, why. Like uh, we do not want uh, these things to happen in the first place, right? Let's just understand the idea of transparency as to how this thing works out. Firstly, if they want to tell us that uh, you know companies are involved in very bad habits and like you know companies can go on to like do uh, things which are not uh, complying with the standards and this and that, we need to realize that employees work in these companies who have got access to each and every record, and there are whistleblowers, and there are a lot of companies who were not publicly traded, traded, or traded, but whistleblowers were able to find out the loopholes or the bad things that the company was doing, right? So that mechanism exists on both sides of the house. We do not understand as to how a company can deal in bad faith or work in bad faith unless these whistleblowers or people have uh, access to information, which includes the investors in the first place, right? We also talk about as to like uh, why, you know, uh, uh, after public trading, what is the problem, right? So right now, I am a company. I became one million just because I was able to organically grow like that. After I'm publicly traded, the way to go ahead is to form a public image, right? To form a public image takes precedence over any kind of organic growth that I can do to my revenues. 
Why that is bad is because as soon as public image takes precedent for a particular company, they involve themselves more into greenwashing. They involve more themselves more into ideas where like uh, the image, uh, the value of the company can increase artificially. At that particular point in time, it causes more harm to the people than causes good. We feel that when companies have the right and uh, uh, have the right and the autonomy to go about the process, they are much more uh, they are much more uh, nervous about it. All right. Now, moving forward and as to why we think that then uh, what should work here, right? We say that the only problem that uh, uh, government poses to us is whether these companies are going through regula uh, regulatory checkups or not. We say that as soon as the company gathers 1 billion dollar, uh, 1, 1 billion uh, rupees or dollar of wealth, we say that yes, the government should interfere and go on towards regulatory uh, checks of those particular countries which still exist through income tax checks, which still exist through you know uh, random checks uh, done by the fiscal instruments in the uh, in the country, and with that we feel that those regulatory checks, as a counterfactual in itself, uh, will be, uh, will be very valuable for the entire discourse. Where the company will still be able to uh, maintain their autonomy and will still be able to organically be, uh, grow as a company or have the autonomy to decide whether they want to uh, do uh, do it or not. Right. Uh, so what we have given to you is that we have told you as to why. You know, uh, going public is a strategic idea. It is based on the uh, current structure of the company, and therefore, the whole company should have the autonomy of whether they want to go public or not. Because until unless that uh, does not happen, the structure can get formed, and whoever, whomever invests in that company is only going to end up in losses. We talk about as to how taking them uh, down of wealth does not actually work in every scenario. And if every company is uh, made to go publicly traded, then that taking down of wealth is going to reduce to a larger extent because loss of demand and forces is going to uh, begin a zero some game we talked about as to how the public image if takes precedence allows companies to have a more uh, have a higher incentive to go on and uh, do things like greenwashing and we also tell you as to how the transparency of the company and the access to information still exists on both paradigms and whistleblowers on exist on our paradigms as checks and balances thank you with this with this very proud of course <laughs> All right, I'll take a PR from CEO. Um, yeah, pretty much it. Starting in three, two, one. First thing they claim is an argument of autonomy. I don't think this is valid simply because of the fact that you still have the board of directors, you still have internal processes in terms of what the company wants to do and go forward. Just that your shares are traded publicly does not mean to what extent is autonomy eroded, something also they don't prove. Probably you still have the board of directors, the board of trustees, the group of individuals who take decisions for the company. We're pretty sure that even if Tata is publicly traded, like the upper higher, what you call the echelons of all the echelons of power, still take directions in terms of where they want to expand and like why to conduct market operations in which domain. So I'm not sure like you completely set up your company to the extent you have no autonomy at all. But second, they say like, oh, okay, the company is valid. The company has actually combined with no amount of money and then it's some kind of an inflated valuation. I don't see what the problem at the end of the day. So the argument literally is, let's say for example, it's time consuming, it's resource intensive. We're talking about a billion dollar company in the first place. So I'm pretty sure you have millions of dollars still in terms of revenue or probably millions of dollars in terms of equity and debt. So probably you have the financial resources in that way. You can't be like valued at thousand dollars like in terms of revenue and then be valued at a billion. I don't think on terms of scale that really works. So probably like have millions Millions of dollars in terms of liquid cash existing in the first place. Not sure why this is a problem. The last thing that this says in terms of you can still have regulatory frameworks. The problem with that is if it's not publicly traded, these companies are largely likely to do things like private auditing, or like say, for example, hire private contractors, contractors to do auditing for themselves and their companies and publish those reports. The benefit of the public, like the IPO literally is that now it's up to public domain, which means you cannot like rely on the people that say, for example, are in your inner circle to go ahead and conduct these reports in the first place, which is when it comes into public light, that's where you get the amount of scrutiny for these companies. That's why it's more democratic, that's why the checks and balance are comparatively more in terms of scale than say internal and private audits that they would then combine on their side. Few things there in terms of 
Uh, I think that pretty much takes out like opening opposition analysis under the government with the new case in the second speech. What is the need and necessity to do this? Secondly, I want to talk about why it's beneficial for the company. Lastly, in terms of markets being better. Firstly, in terms of why do you need to do this? The first thing to say here is in terms of I think companies primitively are hardwired to generate as much amount of so-called profit as possible. That's why they take on huge amount of debt, perhaps they're not able to repay back or engage in, say, for example, market practices that are detrimental in the long run, which means in those also, say, for example, disproportionate amount of employee wage gaps. In terms of like, even if you're making a huge amount of profit, do not pay your employees well. Well enough, so you just want to maximize as, as much as possible. Basically, things that go to chronic capitalism at the end of the day. And also, I think this is very primitive that you want to hold as much amount of wealth as possible and keep your margins as much amount of high. So, I think in that regard, I think point at which when you do have uh, the public, like when you essentially are forced to essentially like trade publicly, I think at that point of time, you're much more likely to be compared to be more accountable. But secondly, the public IPO essentially means that the PR, that, that literally, like your PR image is more likely to be affected simply because like, when you get that backlash from, like, say, for example, external agency, you're more likely to question you. Say for example, if you are making a huge amount of profit, but you're disproportionately paying your employees less, or you have a huge amount of debt that you're not able to repay back, I think those are things that are likely to be publicly flagged, and that's going to have like damage the PR and reputation of your company that there's media discourse about it in the first place to begin with. Which at that point of time, you're more likely to keep this, like, comparatively engage in more, like, efficient market practices than say for example, uh, the, like the problematic things that companies do in the first place. Also, uh, secondly, we're going to talk about in terms of like, why it creates little because of the motion on your records, it also why this prevents the startup bubble from happening in the first place to begin with. I think the problem with large startups and unicorns existing is that are things like fake signaling. That is to say, they huge offer huge amount of discounts in the beginning to capture as much amount of market share as possible. This is literally why that is like inflated and valued incredibly high. It's not like having proper market mechanisms, balance sheets that they can present in the first place. Which is a more amount of market saturations and more amount of startups that eventually crashing and going out of business as food fund, etc. I think at that point of time, like you're less likely for those and market crashes to happen when you know that you have to go public post one million dollars. So you're likely not only to go like any like have transparency there, but the entire process of reaching that is something that you're more likely to be aware of, which is in that regard, the entire process through which company engages in those mechanisms and like to does so is comparatively better. The amount of checks and balances that you put is way more likely to be high. I think at that point of time, you actually prevent, say, for example, crashes and over market saturation. There's a lot of startups literally go out of business, creating more amount of market volatility. Second, I want to talk about in terms of why the markets are likely to be better. I think one, it gives you proper signaling for investors. And not here, markets are incredibly competitive, like developing countries also are competing with each other to access like give like signal to investors in the first place. Say for example, India competes with right now Vietnam in terms of manufacturing and getting quarters. Say for example, like a lot of companies like literally like uh, South Korea and like Taiwan competing with each other for investors to invest in the semiconductor industry. This means that given the countries are internally competing no, and the amount of investors that you have is comparatively limited and this signal better to the investors in terms of saying that you have more amount of market confidence. But why do developing countries need it and why this mechanism is important? Because no, these are countries that are already perceived to be, say for example, weaker financial institutions in the first place. Less amount of regulatory bodies, say for example, than the United States essentially have. Like Federal Reserve essentially are comparatively less powerful in these places. But also things like bureaucracy and red tape yeah. means that the, pre that the signal is largely negative and these countries lag low in the corruption perception indexes in the first place. Which means to say, the only way you yeah. counterbalance this and get the sorts of market confidence, a signal to the investors that this economy is one yeah. that we want to invest in because we have this public check and balances, media scrutiny, etc. It's fine for yeah. it. Uh, which means you have those market checks and balances and when it's on public record, I think at that point of time you signal to the investors that it's something that you ought to invest in and that's why you're comparatively able to get that edge in that regard. I think that's when you increase confidence, that's the tipping point in terms of getting more amount of investments in. Go ahead, close it. What sort of accountability are you talking about? Stop throwing the word again and again. No one cares. Retail investors don't care about wages. You're not changing government. Regulation. It's literally in terms of public offerings that you do, in terms of to go through public audit system. Yeah, yeah. You're literally your balance sheets are checked from, say, for example, from the opposite side also of the spectrum. Say, for example, individuals who are not in favor of in the first place to begin with. I think that means that you have greater amount of transparency when literally when your records are in public domain and literally not behind closeted doors. I mean, listen to the speech <laughs> people are asking that POI. Okay, why is this beneficial also for employees and subsequently for markets? I think employees can get way better amount of com compensation and they have greater amount of, say for example, voice in these regards when they know that, say for example, if the company is making disproportionately huge profits but the wages are not, say for example, proportionally being paid or the kind of practices that the companies are engaging in. So the kind of media scrutiny that you are uh, holding them to, I think it also impose labor unions in that regard. There's 
compensation, you fight for their rights and also say, for example, demand better compensation, better working, say, for example, conditions in that regard. And it gives you extra levels of ammunition to labor, labor unions in general. When you enter, say, for example, the financial, you know, what you call document, the company is more public. I think at that point of time, it greatly employs benefits in general. Lastly, I think markets are simply better in terms of when we say there's better amount of signaling to investors, but also companies are more likely to grow when you have like better amount of collaborations, more amount of money flowing in to the system. But also this means that more people like to invest in the economy more because they feel more confident because they know that these companies are public and they're more likely to be successful. I think which is more and more people buy shares, more and more people engage with the economy more and there's more amount of liquidity that you get subsequently, which means that the economy eventually grows and there's more trust. We think trust is the most important thing in this debate. Whatever which you go public, which will go when you have the $1 billion, $1 billion cap, that's where you get more amount of market benefits and more amount of investments coming in. Incredibly proud. Of Give me thirty seconds. All right. Um, I'll be taking POIs after the fifth, preferably from closing. Don't raise your hands before the fifth. I'm not going to take it. So, starting my speech, and please don't verbalize your POIs, just raise your hand. I'll take it. Okay. Um, starting my speech in three, two, one. Panel, in this debate today, we need to understand that all the benefits and all the impacts mentioned by opening government in this case have three pertinent questions which they failed to answer throughout their entire speech. So now we are forced to push this burden on closing government in this debate today. The three questions stand as follows. First of all, why is this public trading the exclusive way to regulate these companies when same can be achieved through mandatory disclosure policies that you can uh, that you can bring in and that will mitigate the harms that we are providing to you will happen through their policy. So when the harms can be mitigated by a counterfactual, why is your policy necessary in the first place if you don't prove with exclusivity? Point number two is that they fail to prove why this increased, this cyclical increase and the sustained increase of investor confidence is good in the first place when we have told you why overvaluation is a net negative for the markets because it increases their risk. The third question here is something that they fail to realize in this entire debate is that why are companies incentivized to go public without their own choice in the first place. So as to say that if the company still has its control over its valuation under $1 billion, why, if it does not want to go public, would go ahead and increase its valuation over $1 billion in the first place? It can just very well stay under the radar. As long as they don't answer these three pertinent questions, opposition takes this to bear. Now coming up here, opening government talks, uh, comes up here and talks about that companies over $1 billion need to go ahead and go public, but they fail to give us a time frame as to when this is to happen because that the time frame becomes what is crucial because the valuation of the companies are heavily dependent on time. They keep on changing over time. So in such a case, if they're not giving a mechanism for the same, we'll just go ahead and prove that the company can just wait it out. And even after it uh, crosses $1 billion, it can yeah. just go ahead and uh, take it whenever it chooses, not right now. They come here and talk about the increased information, the increased transparency and the increased trust in the first place. You need to realize that regulatory authorities and regulatory bodies are symmetric on both the sides. But still, the harms posed by their side is that now the companies incentivize further to paint these narratives, to paint these narratives that it is going on and uh, including like good practices in its system, even if it is not. So as to say, when Shivansh comes and tell you, tells you that the companies are now incentivized to go ahead and greenwash further so that they can paint themselves as a sustainable company, you can realize that now the company is not taking tangible yeah. efforts, but just spending its money on painting itself as good rather than on being good. So their information transparency and trust argument does not stand at all. Then they come up here and talk about how they will increase the trust and they will build the investor confidence without telling us why that is an inherently good thing in the first place. You need to realize this, that the harms posed by the overvaluation of companies are far more, as I will tell you through the course of my speech as well. Then they come up here and talk about like how the management uh, still have control of the company, but you need to realize that the management 
while can take executive decision still has to rule in the favor of its shareholders because that is where they derive their their that is where they derive all their support from they cannot take measures that can pose risk of them uh, pose risk of them losing face in, uh, in the eyes of their shareholders so we don't understand why they can go ahead and say that the company is not losing autonomy in the first place then they come up here and talk about like private auditors and or uh, like the company can still go ahead and take private auditors but they fail to prove to us why that is firstly a bad thing you need to still realize that the company is still answerable to their regulatory regulatory authority. So as to say that the company in our paradigm cannot fa fabricate their annual reports, they cannot fabricate their P and L, they cannot fabricate their balance sheet. So in such a case, I don't understand why we have any reason of not trusting these statements in the first place when regulatory authorities exist. Then a major chunk of their argument is about proper signaling to investors. You need to understand one thing that the investors are not going to base their entire calculation of the company based on the share price of what is trading in the market. So I should say that if let's say the market dips or like let's say the company's share value dips because of them losing face or because of them losing like losing valuation because of a scandal or whatever, the investors are more likely to not trust this because this is a something that is likely to not be repeated that this is something that is not a signal of the company's performance in general. We are trying to prove to you that the market, the open market does not just depend on the company's performance but on the company's image. And that is where the problem exists in this paradigm because now the investors are incentivized to not consider the market valuation of the company in the first place because that is not entirely dependent on the company's performance. And investors don't care about the company's image, they care about the company's performance because they're here to make money. Mm -hmm. Then you need to understand that we have proven that a signaling argument is in uh, this signaling becomes ineffective in the first place. So all the benefits that they talk about the signaling are mitigated. Then coming to you why you this are... overvaluation becomes I'm not taking POS, please stop interrupting me. Um, why this overvaluation becomes more important now? Because a lot of these startups who cross $1 billion valuation are pre-revenue. And for these are new ideas and concepts that are introduced and have a lot of investor confidence back, back on them already. And the, 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 you have all these parallel unicorns focusing on the same concepts backed by different different angel investors in the same space. So as to say that Swiggy, Zomato, Dunk and all these other you know delivery applications going ahead and being backed by different investors just to go ahead ju right. just because there is a lot of confidence in this tech. But what you need to realize is that this confidence in tech does not translate to confidence in the business model. So as to say that in such a situation, what happens is that uh, it is more likely for investors who are there, who are seeing one, let's say one technology going ahead and, you know, receiving a lot of funding in the first year and uh, there's a lot of confidence attached to it. So they're more likely to go ahead and fund some another startup focusing on the same technology in the sphere of missing out, in the sphere of missing out that because nobody can really predict what technology will go ahead and, you know, be successful. This leads to a bubble being created, sort of asset, bu asset bubble being created. This is the exact reason why the dot-com bubble burst also happened. And this poses a huge problem. I'll tell you why. Because um, this increases the risk in the market. And unless and this is inherently bad, unless they can prove to us, unless the closing bench can prove to us that this increased risk in the market is a good thing, they lose this debate. Another thing that you need to realize is that opening government talks about developing markets. The problem with developing markets is that they don't understand that developing markets have a problem of not having large competing businesses, large competing corporations. So in such a situation, why would a company be incentivized to lose uh, like control or lose autonomy in the first place because now there is an active disincentivization of crossing the $1 billion valuation mark because that means you will lose your autonomy. So I don't understand why the company will go ahead and cross that mark in the first place. The company can very well just stay under the $1 billion valuation mark which is exceptionally bad for these developing markets which need these large corporations to fund jobs, which need these large corporations to fund capital, which need these large corporations to cause sustainable development in the first place. Then they also talk about, you know, these companies kicking out startups without the regulation, but you need to realize that even publicly traded companies do the same, for example, so as to say that Geo can kick out Airtel and all these companies, even while being a publicly traded company, we prove to you that throughout this situation, the harms that exist of this market, uh, of these companies trading on the market are way more. And unless they can answer the fundamental questions for the same, these harms stand and their benefits have already been mitigated. Thank you so much.
starting my speech in three, two, one. I want to do two pieces of framing and then two extensions. <laughs> Firstly, on where this debate is set. Note most unicorns in this world, like 90% of them, just form within the US. OG's case of developing nations is extremely marginal at its very, very best. So it's unclear why any of this actually stands. Secondarily, I want to point out that O is not actually stupid, even though long diagonal seems to be laughing at them. OG has a problem solution mismatch. If your case is that you want to prevent risky business strategies, then why is it that you're specifically targeting unicorns? We are actually going to explain to you what happens uniquely when you hit the billion dollar mark and why there's a problem there. We think there's a cultural problem and it's with the status of unicorns as a whole. What does this look like? It means that when you're hitting the 1 billion mark, you get Forbes articles written about you. You get business reviews. They talk about what exactly you are doing. And this is something people try to copy. Secondarily, the US in itself cares itself as bureaucracy. The Department of Economics puts out statistics and takes pride in them. Look, this is how much unicorns we actually managed to put out. This is not very great, right? This means that what you're gaining is a race to get to the valuation. This creates a huge incentive for you to get to this mark, for you to gain a huge amount in terms of valuation and gain a lot of confidence. What do we think is our business practices actually look like and why do we think they're problematic? One, we think there's an overwhelming emphasis on getting to this mark and we're bringing in a corrective measure. One, you hire a lot of PR and you hire a lot of yeah. connections. You do things like go to meet where you're able to put your product as look, this is so new and innovative. Secondarily, angel investors put excessive amounts of money. And the explanation for this is that note that when you are getting to the unicorn mark, you are getting that sort of status, you are able to garner a lot more funding. And this means that it becomes very lucrative for you to get to this mark and then use your exit option to have profit for yourself. This is why a lot of private big players manage to get out of it. Thirdly, we think that insofar as you are capturing, a, you have this image of a loss marketing, a loss making, capture, you market capture, and you manage to garner your image and things like that. Why do we think we're able to get corrective measures for this? I want to note the only mechanism OG has in, like throughout two speeches. You put out information and then people do things and people see things. I want to be comparative. What happens when you have shareholders and what happens when you have a private board of directors? Once. You spend a lot less money on PR specifically because the calculus no longer pays off for investors. Note, the same investors have power on both sides of the house when you're starting to get to the unicorn value. But you have a marginal calculus that investing in PR this much is going to get me this much later in valuation. And that is why I'm able to garner a lot more for me. We change this. We change the incentive structure preemptively. Secondarily, we think that when you actually have shareholders, it's not just about invest, like just uh, get giving out information. You have to do things like issue quarterly reports to them. You have to answerability to them. What this means is that there are different kinds of shareholders that you have. Some of them only have 5 million. Some of them have 500. The majority are likely to have 5 million, which means that short term is. The problem with this that occurs is at the point at which you have them and you're loss making or you're pushing too much into speculation, at the point market dumping occurs. They give away your share. This means that your direct incentive trying to gain valuation goes away because market dumping is horrific for your own shares. Thirdly, and this is something that OG just asserts, right? You really, really, really need a successful IPO. Note that the problem with an ineffective IPO is that as a point at which it's ineffective, it's a direct active harm. You, you lose like 35 to 40% of your valuation on the spot, which means that you need to recover again. This means that you lose a lot of your already existing investors goodwill and you are unable to take upon more capital until, until you are able to prove these things. Fourthly, you want to be seen as safe. Note the difference in labels that you're, you're trying to get on both sides of the house. On their side, you're trying to get to the unicorn label so you can garner a lot more funding, you can garner a lot more valuation. On our side, you probably want to get yourself as safe as possible because you want to tie your own company to things like the index funds. You want to make sure that when you're trying, when people are trying to buy stocks, you're safe and people can buy it within you. Therefore, we change the incentive structures in and of itself. Is there a POI? If, the, if you can see that it's a short term incentive and you need to look at quarterly reports, why is it that these companies will have favorable favorable atmosphere for growth to begin? Here's the problem. 
we think that in so far as the valuation like look the way these companies operate is a large amount of them are like privately owned until the, they do the dumping and things like that at the point at which they are privately owned they don't have things like reporting or quarterly reports to do and things like that their incentives go away because the marginal calculus in you gaining that extra valuation pays off for you in the amount of money you try, try get to make when you are actually reaching a higher valuation this is the shift in incentive structure we get. <laughs> Let's talk about valuations and why we get accurate valuations. Note, all analysis in DPM is you preemptively change things because you give information and you stop bubble. This is not analysis. This is an assertion. We're actually going to analyze this. Three structural reasons for this. One, we think the idea of perceived value in these companies as a narrative is just inherently different. What does this mean? We think that on their side, a large amount of the perceived value in these companies is on things like scalability, things like where can I get this to? And on our side, this shift to the amount of profit that you can make. Why do we think this is better? Because you know, on their side, it's a lot more speculative and has a lot more human error associated with it. Yeah. On scalability, you put in an extra emphasis. On our side, it's a lot more concrete. Similarly, secondarily, on the actual assets you have, people try to inflate the value of their own assets. This is why Tesla, even though it makes such little revenue, is worth, was worth like hundreds of billions of dollars. This is why NFTs, which were assets, were sold on their projected value or not their actual market value on what tangibly they are. This is where we shift on what we are emphasizing upon and we get a lot more tangible value associated with assets. Thirdly, just psychologically, Note that the work culture within these companies and how it shifts at the point of time, you it's no longer about gaining valuation. That means that when you set goals and milestones, like getting to that first hundred million or getting to that first billion, and all of us must get there, and you have lavish, we'll have a huge lavish party once we get to five hundred million dollar valuation. All of this shift at the point of time, you take away the incentive to get to those valuations in the first place, which is why we think psychologically we're significantly better to guarantee accurate valuations. For all those reasons, proud of you. Uh, wait, am I audible if I talk like this? Let's just get it up. Why am I speaking in D to one? Well, I think we need a basic lesson in what the difference between a startup and a business is. Because the problem with side government is that they are arguing that startups need to function like businesses without ever telling you what the cost of it is, right? At the point at which I don't have VC money to invest in things like growth. At the point at which I don't have the liberty to go into and become a larger and larger company while running at a loss, I lose out on a lot of specific unique benefits you get from that investment, right? I can't do things like more innovation. I can't establish economies of scale, which make things significantly cheaper for people. We tell you that this is the cost that is, this is the opportunity cost that they completely missed from side government, right? But then two things that takes opening government out of this case. Because they told you that the best way to get accountability is to put this in the public and that's probably when you get this, right? Two responses. One, we think that VCs do due diligence, right? And this is independent of opening ops, right? But they just told you, oh, we will mandate these companies to do that. Not sure why you're capable of doing that in the first place, right? But at the point at which I'm putting Series A and Series B capital, which probably happens when my firm is already a really big company, I want to do that kind of due diligence, right? When I'm cutting a $100 million check, it means the loss that I will face at the point at which this company goes bankrupt or overvalues itself or does all of these kind of practices 
is significantly much more. But second, the way most VCs like exit out of a company is through an IPO in the first place, right? Which means when I became a five billion dollar company, I will be able to file an IPO, probably have the incentive to do that. But the time when companies choose to do that is when they become profitable or close to becoming profitable, right? What they never told you from opening government side is why exactly the one billion dollar mark is the place where they actually have to do this. In my speech, I'm going to tell you why that's not the case. But finally, Vijay had this idea that, oh, you won't spend in things like PR, right? Sure, that's not the place where you end up running your money. And what you probably are spending more on PR, right? Which is if you all agree that in a public market, the way people think about you also matters along with your balance sheet, you probably need to go out there and put yourself as a good company, right? So you will be the one spending more on PR. We tell you that the biggest costs that they want to cut are things like growth and innovation, and that's problematic. That brings me to my extension. The first part in here is why do you have to change strategies to your low growth strategies in like if you want to go to the public market immediately after this billion dollar mark, right? Because government picked examples. They told you that no, these companies fuck employee culture. That's how they make money, right? They buy and shut down other firms and that's how they make money. Look, already public companies do that. Like Google is a public company and literally does this to begin with. Right? There's so many public companies that continue doing this, not so how you have any sort of solvency, right? We think that the only difference that like retail investors or anybody in the market think about really hard is how much profit is this company right. making, not just in terms of things like growth potential, right? Because the risky investment to make at the point at which you're investing and like making a bet just on the basis of growth potential, which is why we think that VCs are the best people to do that. So where exactly are you going to cut this money from? Four places. You're going to invest less money in innovation, right? Which means things like drug discovery startup will not be able to do more R&D to find the next cure for things like Alzheimer's, right? You probably won't get wearable health technology because that is a very big sunk cost that a billion dollar company still needs to go ahead and put at the point of time it wants to go ahead and make new products. Second, it's very hard for you to establish an economy of scale. When Amazon wanted to establish a delivery network with so many delivery partners, it means that the fixed yeah. cost that it puts in that is going to be extremely high. It'll probably take you five years to get that kind of return. The average retail investor who is in it for the short-term interest, just like government conceded, will not understand that and will not be okay with that kind of decisions, right? Thirdly, innovative business models are really hard to track. When Zomato was the company that was growing up in the first place, they did not really know how to make money when they set up, right? They pivoted after they became a huge ass company, and that's probably how they got profitable five to six years down the line. And fourth, you can't hire more people faster, right? At the point at which there is more growth, it means that you can pay more salaries rather than things like ESOPs to their own employees, meaning that we have more employee security, more money right. that goes to them rather than just things like. Like stocks before we move on. God, okay. it's so uncomfortable because it's doing even rate so once you have an IPO, which means all the stuff on innovation can still be achieved regardless. And more importantly, we expect the necessity of having an IPO as long as companies have strong incentives to not do this because they need a financial system couple of responses to that, right? One, the problem with the kind of people putting money in an IPO is not VC investors, right? They are not people that no, think no, of, oh, no. I will get profits three years later, which means it's okay if you run on losses for the next five years. The average retail investor, by your own, like all of your Mexico work, need to be somebody who cares about the short term in the first place, which is why these are the kind of costs that are going to be cut down at the point at which they go public. Why then do we think VC checks will okay. die out for startups in the early stage if this is mandated? And I know that this is particularly important material because the, uh, like the incentive for a VC is so that the company can grow and make massive amounts of money and they can exit it by selling it in the public market, right? Three reasons why this will dry out and why they won't get alternative funding. One, at the point at which you don't make money during a billion dollar IPO, a VC won't want to cut you a hundred million dollar check for like a 5% valuation, right? Because they're unlikely to pursue growth strategies and become even bigger. Note that a lot of companies file for IPO only after their series A, I'm not taking you sit down. Series A and Series B, which means it's unlikely they make a lot of money. Second, markets are volatile, right? Which means even if you do put in that money and they do pursue growth strategies, the problem is the fact, and markets are volatile irrespective. The problem is the fact that unlike, like at the point at which you post the lot, every quarter your stock price gets hit, which means it's very unlikely that this VC will be able to make their money back at the point at which you pursue a growth model. The third thing, you can't go ahead and see companies becoming bigger than a billion dollars, which is something that VCs are constantly 
that we pushing for, right? Especially ones that enter a startup in the later stage, ones that fund the growth of that startup rather than initial seed funding, right? Which is why we think that it's very unlikely that you get this kind of money. Retail investors inherently want to protect their stocks. And after every quarterly report, if it means that the amount of like like my stock price is constantly getting hit because I'm pursuing growth strategy that is still making me post losses, it means that the company will pull back this kind of strategy because retail investors will exit that stock. We think that that's absolutely horrible. Why? Because if you're unable to get like innovation and cheaper products, it means that it's going to take more time for innovative products to reach the market. The problem with this is that if you get like a wearable digital health device that is much easier for older people and keeps them much safer, it doesn't get into the market for another five years. You don't get access to education technology. You don't open up markets to individuals and reduce the kind of prices if you don't follow this kind of growth. Because we told you that there are incentives and other strong mechanisms to ensure that mismanagement does not happen at the same time we told you why like og's case is literally the same as what happens in the market right now not sure what they're mandating and why exclusively we're the side that gives you the money and benefits in terms of growth and better product for consumers both of you <laughs> This debate is about the companies that don't already go public when they're one billion dollars, yeah, yeah, yeah. which means what which which are particularly these kind of companies that don't go public. It's the companies that don't that avoid IPOs because they want a lot of control over themselves. It's the companies that avoid IPOs because they don't want any accountability mechanism. And this is because they want to make very risky decisions. This is because they want to be willing to put the entire market of uh, market confidence at risk so that they can go ahead and make a huge amount of profit, right? These are the companies we specifically want to regulate, which means that the thing that Harsh was telling you about certain companies not being able to make it big because they weren't able to, uh, because people are, are not willing to allow, uh, willing to uh, invest in them, is not, is not really true because a large number of companies which have the actual, which have value in the real economy, which have the ability to grow and, and to grow safely and stably, are the ones which will anyway make the public offerings and not really in this setting. Okay. So, um, firstly, right, why is the, the thing we told you about business practice? Why, why, why is this particularly so important, right? We explain to you specifically why you take a lot less of this and you're going to uh, and, and you're going to have much better business practices based on the incentive that investors that the investors want, sure. right? So uh, how how exactly does this work? Right? So you said you put a lot less money in innovation, right? Two responses to this. Firstly, companies in status, like unicorns in status quo think a PR is enough for them to get valuation, right? Which is which means that in it's only in our world uniquely that you need a good product, you need a new product, and that that is how you can get the valuation in the first place, right? Which means money and innovation is more likely on our side because you can't make, you can't get valuation by PR, you need innovation yeah. for valuation. Yeah. But also secondly, right, big companies can probably do innovation a lot better than small companies and we're happy to make, if big companies are the ones doing the innovation in the first place, right? But also finally, right, for valuation, a lot of, some percent of the valuation is based on projected growth. The way that your projected growth happens is when you're investing some of your profits into expansion, into innovation, into further growth, right? Which means you do get, you we do have incentives for putting money right. into innovation on our side, I take it. And it just doesn't exist so much on CEO's side, right? All right. And, 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 now, and also finally, right? This is a $1 billion company, right? If the company is fairly valued, that means you have a certain degree of assets, you have a certain degree of capital available to you and a certain degree of market share, which means you're getting, you're probably getting enough profits for you to be able to invest at least some part of this into market, into growing your company, some part of it into expansion. So my CEO is completely out of this debate, right? All right. Now let's talk about uh, let's talk about the idea of valuation, right? 
Oh, has a weird idea that if you have demand and supply, then the value of a share increases hugely, right? This is not really true, right? When does the value of the share increase? When it's publicly traded, right? When it's because it is when investors are willing to buy that share. What are the kinds of share that the average investor, the which I told you, that five the guy with five million dollars yeah. is willing to buy, right? He wants a safe company with low risk. He wants a company that probably has a lot of real assets, like factories, like production centers, like a company that is getting a lot of have have has a lot of sales, having a lot of. Uh, money flowing in and out, right? This is the kind of company the average investor wants to invest in because he thinks it is a safe option to put his life savings Be into, right. right? Which means that we think if these kind of companies have higher values, that is no, that is a good thing, right? But also secondly, right? Um, when you have shareholders, they don't just want the value of their shares to be high; they also want dividends from that share. Right? The only way you get dividends is when you have profits when you have revenue right when you have a revenue stream right so the revenue stream only get established yeah. on our side when instead of spending your money on marketing it's the problem which i frame you put the money instead in the things that in, in the things in, in things like producing more in things like building more factories or having more sales right this is how you get actual revenue which you can give out to shareholders as dividends which you can which is something uniquely shown by our side right okay so this, this is why you, instead of having false and overvaluation, you're likely to have fair valuation, you're likely to have better valuation yeah. based on your assets and uh, assets and sales in the real economy, which we think is necessarily good, right? But also finally, uh, to take out OO, right? You see the companies have values, uh, get their valuation by different mechanisms. There's no clear explanation as to what this is and why it's particularly destroyed by opening the company up to an IPO. You know, the they tell you a company should have autonomy, right? We think the place yeah. the company should have autonomy is probably in its day-to-day -day work, right? in how it decides yeah, yeah. to, uh, and, and so on, right? We don't think that companies should have autonomy to be able to spend all its money in one risky venture that, that, that destabilizes the entire market, right? I mean, that is, that, that, that particular part of the case, completely out of their debate. Okay, I'll take it. Yeah, how does manipulation happen uh, in a private company where the uh, matter of valuation here is sales, revenue, debt, and equity, while in your case, uh, public image and PR and what? I'm going to explain that investors want dividends. Investors want uh, valuation based on assets and so on in the real economy. Is there anything for me? See All right. Same now. Okay. So. Uh, so how how do we also weigh over O O right O O O sorry O G right? They tell you that you need things like that the, the that big corporations can do things like lobby states and be a, and a, unaccountable to employees. This is the problem they frame as sales for it. We think this problem exists to some extent even in our world because even now the board the board and the shareholders still want to push for maximum profit. Right? You still have you still try to get that. You simply use different mechanisms to get that. Right? Labor unions can exist even in your world. Right? What we what uniquely changes the kind of business practices you do that we explain to you when you choose to put that money into, into things like expanding into an innovation into expanding your company in the first place, right? But also secondly, right? We think that business practices are prior to accountability for two reasons. Firstly, right? Accountability, the point of accountability that they want is that companies do good things with their money, that companies don't make take risks, and companies invest in better business practices and, 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 and uh, don't take risks, right? We, we ensure that by, by a different mechanism, where, where we say that investors and what investors uh, and sorry shareholders and what they push for gets the same uh, gets gets the same thing uh, as they want from accountability right but also secondly right they tell you you want more investment you want more liquidity right and even CEO tries to say liquidity is good we don't think liquidity is necessarily good right we think that the companies that want liquidity particularly are the ones that already go public and status quo so that is not a uh, impact they can claim for their sales, right we think that just more investment is not always good in and of itself. We think that more investment is only good when this company has an actual potential for growth and act and then actually putting its money into things like building factories and so on. Right. So we don't definitely want more liquidity because we're in a time of recession where growth is an all where growth is all time low, and most of the gains from investing in liquidity have been made already. Right? We think that in, because liquidity is not going to get you that far because purchasing power is kind of low already, right? Which means that. Which means that these particular companies, we, we prove to you that you reduce the risk-taking nature of these unicorns. You ensure that they have much better business practices. You ensure that overvaluation is problems.
Am I audible clearly? Okay. I'll be beginning my speech in three, two, one. Two important pieces that literally put us first in this debate without this speech. Firstly, is what is the kind of investors that are that are existed before the company goes public and what are the kind of investors that are existed after the company goes public. Before the company goes public, these look like VCs that want to go ahead and take up risky, note the wiki word here is risky, which is on clash with them, risky ventures in order to go ahead and have high growth, which means even if out of 10 startups, nine of them fail, but one of them succeed, if you're able to tell you why that's beneficial for the market and beneficial for products, innovation, consumers at large, we already win this debate and I'm going away why well, that's the most important but secondly is that insofar as you're bearing losses insofar as this company is going down and this company is focusing on one growth venture like Nantara mentioned this is the reason why unicorns exist unicorns go ahead and focus on risky ventures that go ahead and make big profits it's the job if you're talking about companies that go ahead and have existing technologies like make mass produce i don't know bottles or pens and things like that those models of scales are with big firms that are already established yeah. and already public that is their job and that is what they do during a recession the job of a unicorn during a recession is to go ahead and create technologies that can go ahead and make a product significantly cheaper and go ahead and take up larger risks and we believe that is the only argument that CEO is analyzing and the, the, that's the that, that's the only place I mean sorry that's the place where we are on clash and CG is off clash because CG's lines of analysis work for big firms they work for firms that want to go ahead and have generic business models that are not based on high growth ideas but they don't work in this place and that is why they're off clash with respect to they are but then let's come to let's come to CG's response and take them out of this debate right first on bearing losses and why they said that in, if you if you invest your growth ventures in one bucket then you possibly can bear losses first question to this is so what if a startup bears a loss the impact that i have or the damage that i have is on the people or the employees within the startup i'm okay trading that trade off but they asserted twice that it creates some sort of market crash if a billion dollar company goes ahead and loses their valuation or goes ahead and uh, goes ahead and suffers losses i don't know why that's a tipping point for a market crash it's literally a unicorn it's not a multi-billion dollar multinational company that can cascade some new market loss or market crash like ceo is uh ceo is commenting within their speeches but secondly they didn't have any likelihood of why this company is likely to go into loss in the point in which they put all of their eggs in one basket it might seem intuitive to you that the childhood phrase all eggs in one basket doesn't work but not in this case there are VCs that are funding this idea, which means VCs have an active incentive in order to go ahead and then in order for them to strategize the best way in which they want to achieve the result in right. one basket. These are VCs that are strong and run by educated people that earn millions of dollars in this and are the best possible actors to go ahead and do this, which means then at that point, CG needed to prove to you why. Is it that this either creates a market loss that's big enough for you to create some sort of tipping point or prove to you that these companies, people, this founder or this VC is the most important stakeholder in this debate. We pose it. Both of those are not true. CG is out of this debate. I'll take you later after engaging with you. Now, coming to opening government and why they're out of this debate, right? I think opening government's case makes the least sense in this entire debate room, right? Because opening government's case relies on one premise. Their case relies on this premise that accountability increases. All of their impacts are on one premise. The fact that investors come in from outside, the fact that confidence increases, the fact that this company makes better decisions because they're putting things out in public is all reliant on one premise. And the analysis for this is that, ah, I have to share more information. I have to put out my balance sheets. That's when our accountability is suddenly high. Two pieces of response that already came in Harshit's speech, which is where we had already won the debate. First, is this VC has the direct legal incentive for you to go ahead and have a same system of working from the inside. The VC still knows your profits and losses. They still know your own centers. They never told me 
Why it's important for the public to know this. The only reason why it was important for the public to know this is that retail investor invest in this. And we already told you that retail investors investing is a bad thing because you have quarterly reports like which I considered that have short term goals, which means the retail investors invest. At that point, this company has to go ahead and show that they're making quick profit. They're not able to achieve any of the benefits that come on our side. And Secondly, on accountability, right? Let's come to one by one what they said with respect to IPOs are a unique avenue to build trust. First, investors are risk averse, asserted, and even if they're risk averse, VCs aren't risk averse, something that we already do. They're the investors that's important. Second, is that there's extra financial coverage when these companies are big. Already, two cases already take this down. At the point at which a company reaches a unicorn, there is a lot of financial coverage on that company, like which I mentioned in the Forbes. Etc. But third is that VCs don't invest because they're viewed as corrupt at the point at which there is no accountability. VCs invest before the IPO comes out. Corruption is symmetric because after the IPO comes out, everything is in the out and that doesn't stand right. anyway. Which means they never proved to me that IPOs are a unique way to build trust. And our counter, our counterfactual, or rather not counterfactual, our likelihood of what will happen in the other case is significantly better than opening opposition because we don't say we'll mandate some random regulation. We say that it's likely that the VC would want to go in right. and have this company have accountability in their own eyes and make proper decisions. Your case yes, has a massive assumption that in the absence of the IPO, VCs will have strong incentive to invest within these specific startups. The problem is that while there is market uncertainty, but more importantly for the for startup developing world, these VCs won't invest regardless. What is the comparison? 50. Okay. First, we already told you why VCs are more likely to invest at the point at which you're able to justify high growth strategies at the point at which this company does not need to go public and open up to retail investors that push short-term strategies. VCs want to invest because they get their return from this. This is literally the way in which, no, this is literally the way in which VCs work to begin with. But secondly, even if you don't think that that is true, and even if you think that everything we said that is not true, I'm going to weigh why is it that... Why is it that market market innovation, market progress weighs as the most important thing in this debate? But firstly, let's just understand the scale of impact on this, right? You're able to get cheaper, you're able to get cheaper products. Between every single consumer's experience is better. At the point at which Ola and Uber were uh, at the point at which Zomato was able to keep delivery costs at significantly low, it means that every person got food delivered, every college student did not have to eat from their pathetic messes and so on. Secondly, at the point at which at the point at which you're able to bring in more innovation, fund in more R&D and tell people that I will get my profits 10 years later, I don't need to go public and make my profits in three years or couple of quarters. It means that I'm able to get variable health and AI technologies better. It means that I'm able to get these at a faster rate. And it's no argument to say that we are in a recession, we don't need innovation or whatever. That's there's no tipping point on that, right? And then lastly, is if you don't believe all of these things and you don't think anything we said is true to begin with, the fact that VC checks dry out, the fact that this affects the overall startup ecosystem to begin with, even without market innovation, closing opposition is clearly a person. That's short